Day's event. Absolutely stunning day out there this morning. I was out early this morning and it, no traffic. Say about half past five in the morning, something like that, and just a sheer wall of bird song. It's lovely. Just everything carries on in a natural rhythm, so it's super. Welcome to our fifth annual Data Protection Summit. It's absolutely lovely to have a live audience in front of us again. Well done for turning out. Uh, we're also running the summit through our virtual platform, uh, so welcome to those of you who are joining us online. For those of us actually here, uh, can you remember, and I haven't done this yet, switch your mobile phones to silent. If your mobile phone goes off during a presentation, you have to stand up and do a little dance. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, you've come past the toilets already, they're on level two. Um, if you're watching from home, you have to use your own toilet. No fire alarm test is expected today. Uh, if you hear a loud noise, get out. Uh, my advice would be follow one of the digit staff because they intend living forever. So just follow them and don't wander off because we need to build the count heads afterwards. All catering will take place in the stratosphere, which is just behind the registration desk you came in this morning. If you're parked downstairs, talk to one of the digit staff um, and they'll give you a reduced rate ticket. It's just six quid. It is worth it, trust me. Um, it's still a wee bit different to previous physical events. These things, you know, please carry on wearing them inside if you're moving about. Obviously, you have to take them off if you're eating or drinking, but it's just, or sit, you know, when you're sitting still, it's fine. You don't need to wear a mask. I think this is a really clever idea. You know, the green, the amber, and the red, we were just talking about it. I, I would like to see buttons nationally introduced. Depending on how you feel that day, you could wear a red button or an orange button or a green button. And it, when you walked up to a stranger, you would know. Because I know what my vulnerability is, but I have no idea what your vulnerability is. So please just, you know, respect other people's wishes and car canny, as we say here in Scotland. Whether you're here at the venue or joining the platform, take the time to engage with your peers, talk to some of the uh, people that are upstairs, build new connections, that kind of thing. For virtual attendees, uh, you can submit questions during the main sessions, but don't hang about. There's, inevitably, there's going to be a lag. So if you've got something you want to ask one of the speakers, get it in nice and early, and they'll either get it to me on a slip of paper or they'll text it to me on my phone or something of the kind. There are a number of competitions and prizes on offers upstairs and a virtual leaderboard to reward online participation. And if you are tweeting, if you could use hashtag data pro summit. I mean, to be honest, that's half of your characters gone already, but you know what I mean. Is Ray here? Ray, are you going to talk at the top here? Not, not, not today. Not oh, see, there is a God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Four years uh, since GDPR came into effect. Um, now, that's back while we were in the European <laughs> Union. Uh, there's an old Scots word, I don't know if you know it, ficker. Don't ficker with it. You know, it means don't fiddle with it. Don't, don't annoy it, what have you. Well, inevitably, we're going to have to ficker with GDPR. Things are going to change. So our first speaker today is Lee Pope, Senior Policy Advisor for the National Data Strategy Team. Uh, he's going to be talking about the National Data Strategy and, most importantly, the Mission 2 changes. So, Lee, over to you. Thank you. for having me. So yeah, as, as we just said, I'm here today to talk about the implementation of the UK government's national data strategy. Given the uh, cross-cutting nature of data, um, there's a number of different work streams, different facets to delivering this strategy. Um, I'm going to hone in on a few areas today, especially the work, as we just said, under, the, under mission two of the national data strategy, which is commonly referred to as data reform. And it's all about trying to create a, a pro-growth data protection regime whilst ma maintaining high data standard, data protection standards, given I think this will be of most interest to all of you in this room today. Um, but before I go into detail on the data reform and mission two of the National Data Strategy, I just want to give an overview of the National Data Strategy as a whole. Uh, so in terms of the wider context, um, Data is recognised as one of the Department for Culture, Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sports, or DCMS. It's recognised as one of DCMS's ten tech priorities. Um, I'm sure you all agree in this room that um, we see data as one of the, as the driving force of modern economies. Um, 
but we have identified a number of issues and barriers which are currently preventing us from making the most of the opportunities presented by data for driving economic growth and improving society. So by removing these barriers uh, to responsible data sharing and use, our ultimate aim is to um, become the world's number one data destination, an open, welcoming and secure environment where companies more of the world can innovate and grow and where data improves life for people across the UK. So what is the natural data strategy? Um, in September 2020, DCMS published the national data strategy. Um, it launched a national conversation on how we can make the most of the many opportunities that come from better data use. Um, essentially, it's a framework for action uh, to build an in innovative, pro-growth, data-driven economy underpinned by public trust in such a way that works for everyone across society. Um, one of the key things to bear in mind is our strategy is underpinned by a core position um, that we need to rebalance the debate on data from one where we only see the risks to one where we also see the opportunities presented by better data use. That means creating a regime that doesn't just focus on privacy but unleashes the power of data across the economy and society. And as this slide sets out, um, we see the national data strategy serving a number of functions or purposes. Um, first of all, setting out our ambition on data. So it positions the UK as a global champion of data and drives the international flow of data across borders while continuing to protect data to a high standard. Secondly, it's all about creating a unified narrative on data use. So setting out an ambitious pro-growth approach to data that holds that all can benefit where data is used responsibly and that withholding data can actually have negative impacts. Um, also, it's about providing a policy framework. So provide a framework for new policy issues around the use of data driving the alignment of data-led work across government while creating a shared understanding across the economy of how data is used. And finally, in terms of demonstrating a commitment for action, as I've said, it's really a framework for action to maximise the power of data across the UK. And the framework focuses on the delivery of five missions, which we see as priority areas of action, where we can have significant impact leading to better use of data. I just want to give you a quick visual of the framework. Um, so as you see there, essentially what it's set out is the opportunities presented by data as we see it at the top, then the five missions um, around better data use, and also just flagging some of the core pillars that underpin the strategy. And I'll just quickly go through each of those elements now. So firstly, in terms of the opportunities, um, so the NDS, the National Data Strategy, outlines the opportunities um, that we see if we get this right and fulfil our ambitions to maximise the power of responsible data use across the UK. Um, essentially, we see approved data and access as presenting a major strategic opportunity for economic growth, as well as simultaneously boosting our national security and defence capabilities. It's central to the delivery of a whole range of vital public services and societal goals and government priorities, from tackling climate change to supporting the National Health Service, the levelling up agenda and transition to net zero. Um, and we really feel that the coronavirus pandemic demonstrated actually how much we can achieve with data. So there was increased data sharing from industry to government to make it easier to spot transmissions, risks in real time, where the many examples of improved data quality analysis ensured critical hospital supplies reach where they needed to get to. And we had lots of examples of safe share of data between government, business and the third sectors that enabled life-saving interventions such as healthcare at home and food parcel deliveries. Next, just quickly run you through the um, pillars of the strategy. So um, as the strategy sets out, there's a, we see a number of interconnected issues that currently prevent the best use of data in the UK, and these are reflected in the core pillars of the strategy. So first of all, foundations, making sure that the data you're using is fit for purpose, that it's of a high quality, consistent data standards are being used for the collection and storage of data and so on. Secondly, data skills, ensuring that um, everyone has the right skills to be able to work effectively in a data-driven economy and in the data-rich lives that we find ourselves in. Uh, the fourth pillar is all about availability, so ensuring that data can get to where it's needed. And uh, fourthly, um, responsible data use, so making sure that um, while we're obviously trying to increase and maximise the power of data, we are 
always ensuring it's safe and trusted use of data uh, that we're achieving. And finally, in terms of the um, National Data Strategy Framework as a whole, just turning to the, uh, for the five missions which I mentioned. So as I say, these are the areas where we think the UK government has the greatest role to play in delivering the objectives of our strategy and capitalising on these opportunities presented by better data use. So the first mission, mission one, this is all about uh, focused on unlocking the power of data across the economy. Um, so it's about taking steps to support um, data sharing, access and use, ensuring the right architecture is in place and the right standards are in place for data flows, getting the incentives for organisations to share data right, and supporting new ways of sharing data like privacy enhancing technologies. Mission two, as I say, this is the one I'll be coming on to in a second in most detail, but this is about securing a pro-growth and trusted data protection regime. Uh, so essentially it's about the UK's approach to data being one where we, we imagine the ability to continue in protecting data to a high standard, whilst also creating the optimal condi conditions for growth. Mission three, um, while DCMS is overall responsibility for delivering the UK government's national data strategy, mission three is the um, responsibility of the Cabinet Office, given they have responsibility for how government uses data. So this mission is all about transforming the UK government's use of data itself. Um, we see it as all governments can get more out of the data assets they hold, and it's something that citizens expect us to do. And this will really be a decades-long program to build capability that keeps pace with the data capabilities industry and academia. Straight one sec. In terms of mission, mission four, this is all about the increasing importance of data in the workings of our economy and society. And society. It means we're increasingly dependent on data and on the infrastructure that supports data use. And again, COVID really um, highlighted this, the ability of so many countries to move to digital, remote working. This is all dependent on the resilience and security of data and of the infrastructure um, which supports data use. So this mission is all about, uh, it's focused on taking action to build confidence in and set a stronger risk management framework for the security and resilience of the physical and virtual infrastructure on which data use relies. And the final, the fifth mission, this is the international, internationally focused mission. So now that the UK has left the EU, we're trying to capitalise on the UK's new found sovereignty to champion the benefits of global data flows as a driving force for growth, innovation and cooperation. Um, we plan to use repatriated powers from Europe to make it easier to exchange data from the UK and other jurisdictions. And we're also seeking to shape the global rules and norms of the data ecosystem um, within, which those data, within which data flows. So essentially here we want to uh, free up data to reach its full potential. Um, and we want to steer the global debate on data so that it's recognised and embraced as a force for good. So in terms of implementing the national data strategy, I think the, fr the three uh, key things to flag here are in terms of governance, in DCMS we have our Cross Whitehall National Data Strategy Implementation Steering Group. This has ultimate accountability for the strategy's delivery. We're also focused on monitoring evaluation. Since September last year we, launched, we published our monitoring evaluation uh, framework which sets out how we will monitor uh, whether the strategy is having the desired impact. Um, we're focused on tracking delivery of government's interventions, assessing their effectiveness and drawing from these insights uh, for further interventions in the future. And the third sort of key area of our implementation program is all about engagement. Um, we are really clear that the uh, national data strategy is not the final answer, but it's part of a conversation about the way that we support the better use of data across the whole of the UK. Um, we've therefore established the national data strategy forum. Um, it brings together perspectives from industry, academia, civil society and the wider public. And it's all about trying to ensure that diverse perspectives continue to inform the implementation of the strategy. Um, and we really see it as essential to ensure the framework remains fit for purpose, given the backdrop of a fast evolving technical and policy landscape. Um, just to pick out, um, conscious obviously of you guys in Edinburgh today, a real core element of this programme is ongoing engagement with devolved administrations. Um, to be absolutely clear, the national data strategy covers reserved policy areas, um, for the whole of the UK and where it covers devolved um, areas it applies to England only. So the devolved administrations they're not directly responsible for any specific deliverables or implementation activities. Ultimately it's up, up to the devolved administrations to determine whether they want to adopt similar approaches to what we're taking in 
devolved policy areas. Um, but we recognise that given the cross-cutting nature of data, and obviously a number of these areas are reserved areas as well, uh, there will be implications for devolved administrations and stakeholders across the UK from implementing these policies. So we've really focused on, on that engagement with across the UK to make sure that we're hearing those views. And as part of that, we've established a forum which brings together data policy officials from DCMS, from Cabinet Office, and from each of the devolved administrations. It's all about discussing the implementation of our respective strategies and sharing insights and best practice related to data policy. Um, and in terms of what, what we've achieved so far, so um, this slide attempts to set out the different uh, milestones already that have um, associated with the national data strategy. Just to pick out a few of the headlines, um, so the September publication in 2020 when we initially published the strategy, that um, also launched a consultation on the content of the strategy. Um, we published the government response to that consultation last May, um, and I think the real headlines from that were that um, the feedback confirmed that the framework that we set out within the National Data Strategy was seen as fit for purpose, and that the actions taken to ensure we realise the data opportunities are absolutely vital. Um, respondents generally welcomed our framing of data as a strategic asset that should be used for economic and societal benefits. However, respondents also really emphasised that we need to ensure that data is used responsibly and that the data revolution that we're trying to seek here works for everyone everywhere. And they really highlighted the importance of continued engagement with stakeholders and members of the public, given the significance of, these, of the issues around data use. And then just finally, the slide, this slide also highlights some of the other sort of key things that I've mentioned, so the publication of the monitoring and evaluation framework and the launch of the consultation on data reform. Um, which I'll be coming on to shortly. Um, just to give you some highlights from other missions, I, pre so I appreciate that the mission two is probably the most relevant to all of you guys, but I think you'll still find interest in some of the other missions as well. Um, so firstly, in terms of mission one, um, as this slide shows, there's been a number of, sort of um, different um, progress in a number of areas related to this mission. So first of all, we published a policy framework in November, um, and it's a framework for the government, um, the action the government seeks to take to set the correct conditions to make private and first sector data more usable, more accessible, and available across the UK economy. Uh, secondly, um, working with the US at the Summit for Democracy in December 2021, we launched a, a prize challenge, looking at novel uh, privacy-enhancing technologies for data sharing. Um, Thirdly, I say as part of the data reform consultation, um, we launched a consultation on how government can support an effective ecosystem for data intermediaries, or so those third parties which enable data sharing. And we also importantly refreshed advisory board for the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation to help drive forward the centre's remit to support data-driven innovation. Um, but as the policy framework that published in November outlines, there's still a number of barriers, challenges and areas where we need to prioritise action to fulfil our overarching ambitions for unlocking the value of data. Um, for example, about promoting the development of good data standards, encouraging development and uptake of privacy enhancing technologies, using incentives to maximise value for money in support of uh, the public. Um, so we're in the process of putting together a significant programme of work to deliver against these challenges and risks set out in this slide. Um, it's likely to include putting together a significant um, investment or business case for government to consider in terms of how we can take this forward. And obviously we'll provide updates on how this work is progressing as it develops further. And then finally, in terms of um, the mission related to championing international data flows, again, there's been some progress in this area already. So. As the slide sets out, we've brought the ICO's new International Trade Transfer Agreement and an addendum to the new EU standard contractual clauses into effect in March 2022. Um, last summer, we announced the priority countries for UK data adequacy assessments. Um, we've also finalised and published trade agreements with Australia, New Zealand and Singapore. Um, and we've commenced negotiations with India. And we've also um, continued our engagement through the G7 um, and uh, making progress made during the UK G7 presidency. So coming on to the um, data reform consultation itself, in, 
In terms of context, I think the key thing to emphasise here is um, we launched a consultation last September, on the 10th of September, on potential reforms to create an ambitious pro-growth and innovation-friendly data protection regime that underpins the trustworthy use of data. Uh, the consultation was entitled Data A New Direction. Um, as this slide um, tries to illustrate, um, the data reform consultation we see as very much the first step in delivering mission two of the national data, national data strategy to create a secure pro-growth and trusted data regime. But while the data reform work form, falls under mission two, in practice, we also see these reforms supporting delivery, delivery of other um, national data strategy missions, particularly Mission 1, and Mission 3, and Mission uh, 5, which I've, which I've talked through. In terms of the uh, vision for the data, um, data reform work, um, firstly, it's all about supporting government's plan for the UK uh, as a scientific superpower. It's also about building on the higher watermark for data use um, seen in, in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's about securing the UK's status as a global hub for data. It's about reinforcing responsibility of businesses to keep personal data safe and encourage investment in compliance activities that reflect how they operate and their users' expectations. And it's about ensuring that the ICO remains a world leading regulator and that the ICO is empowered to protect personal data while ensuring organisations can use personal data responsibly to achieve economic and societal goals. So coming on to the actual the content of the consultation, um, as this slide sets out, that can be broken down to five key chapters or themes. Um, so first of all, in terms of removing barriers to responsible innovation, uh, we heard from stakeholders that under the current regime, certain definitions are unclear or lack in explanatory case law. Organisations may choose not to use data as fully as possible, um, owing to concerns of a penalty under the law, even when this is not applicable. So the proposed reforms set in the consultation um, are all about seeking to remove these barriers, but offering clearer uh, rules and streamlined legislation, um, particularly so that researchers and innovators can use data responsibility to improve their products and services. Uh, so that the reforms proposed in the consultation are all intended to create, a more, uh, to create more certainty for organisations about when and how they can uh, responsibly use personal data. Then the second sort of key theme or chapter is about reducing burdens on business. Uh, so we really want to reduce the burdens on business created by some of the GDPR's prescriptive rules that prioritise process over protection, where we see it as imposing unnecessary costs and consequently diverting resources away from ensuring accountability and responsible data use. So what we proposed in, as part of the consultation would be to implement a more flexible and risk-based accountability framework um, that would be based on privacy, manage, uh, privacy management programmes and under this framework, organisations will be required to implement a privacy management programme tailored to their processing activities and ensure data privacy management is embraced holistically rather than just as a tick box exercise. Um, the third sort of key area is about boosting trade and removing barriers to data flows. So we want to remove unnecessary um, barriers to cross-border data flows. Um, we see as businesses need uh, flexible and reliable mechanisms for the cross-border transfer of personal data. Um, so the proposals we set out were all about helping domestic business connect with foreign markets as well as attracting foreign investment by businesses which value the trust and confidence built through responsible data use. So we propose um, we introduce reforms that allow the UK to focus on proportionate and risk-based decision making when undertaking adequate assessments with other countries. The fourth uh, key area around delivering better public services. So um, we see the responsible Use, responsible use of personal data can really revolutionise the public sector, creating better, cheaper and more responsive services. And again, this was really demonstrated during uh, the response to COVID-19. Um, however, there are there's persistent challenges to collecting, using and sharing personal data, to deliver uh, these services, and public sector bodies often struggle to collaborate with each other and the private sector. So the proposals set out within the consultation looked at how we could more explicitly permit and incentivise personal data use and process in the public interest, including during times of emergency. Um, and we also want to um, improve leadership and coordination within government to address logistical and cultural barriers to data sharing. And then the final area around the uh, Information Commissioner Office, the ICO, 
So our uh, proposed regime would reform the ICOs um, to support a more balanced approach to regulation and encourage the sponsored use of data to drive societal and economic benefits. So this could include um, different proposals we put forward, so a new statutory framework for the ICO, a real power for the um, sector of state to prepare a statement of strategic priorities for the ICO, reform to the corporation sole model, um, new requirements on the ICO to undertake impact assessments, set up an expert panel for complex and, and novel guidance on codes of practice, new requirements on data subjects and data controllers to attempt to resolve complaints before, before being considered by the ICO, and potentially small changes to improve the ICO's enforcement powers. So that's what we um, set out as part of the consultation. Um, the consultation closed last November. Um, overall, we were broadly happy with the level of responses we got. We received um, 2,924 responses. And we also, as part of the consultation period, we focused on a programme of engagement to try and promote the consultation among organisations from across the private and public sector and civil society. Uh, so we partnered with 26 different conveners to organise 40 events um, covering a range of topics within the consultation. This included working with the devolved administrations and territorial offices uh, to ensure that these, some events at least were held with stakeholders in the devolved nations themselves. Um, so we worked with the Scottish Government to arrange for Scotland IS um, to convent, convene a roundtable discussion as part of that. And we also um, received a number of responses from organisations in the devolved administrations, so from Scotland, uh, National Library of Scotland, Children's Here in Scotland, NHS Scotland's Information Governance Forum and the Law Society of Scotland. Um, in terms of the consultations responses themselves, I'm afraid I'm a bit limited on what I can, the amount of detail I can go into today as we're still in the process of analysing those responses and preparing the government response to that consultation. Um, and then obviously the government response will have to go through the collective agreement process and we have to secure agreement from ministers across government before it can be finalised. Um, but what we'll say is some proposals garnered widespread support in terms of the responses. So in general, there was broad support for many of the proposed changes to research provisions, especially the combined research chapter and proposed definition of scientific research proposals. And there was also broad support for removal of consent requirements in relation to audience measurement cookies. But there was strong opposition to removal of um, consent requirements in relation to the more intrusive uh, cookies. Um, but in other areas, it was much more of a mixed picture. So, for example, on whether private bodies carrying out tasks at the request of public authorities should be allowed to rely on public tasks as the lawful ground under Article 6. You had local authorities and other public bodies which welcomed um, the greater clarity that could, that could bring. But privacy rights groups really did raise a number of concerns about potential lack of, lack of transparency and the need for strict limitations if these measures were pursued. And then finally, there were some common requests or words of caution um, in terms of responses. So there was an appetite, there was a real appetite for clearer guidance on how to conduct risk assessments. And a number of respondents reiterated the importance of a robust, well-funded and internationally well-regarded independent regulator. Um, so in terms of next steps, as this slide sets out, um, we're analysing the responses. We'll then be making decisions on what are those proposals set out in the consultation will actually be taken forward and we'll announce precisely what we're taking forward as part of the government response to the consultation which we aim to publish um, in the spring so in relate to that means we hope to in the next couple of months and then in terms of whichever measures we um, determine we can take forward obviously if they involve um, legislative change we'll look to legislate when as soon as we can when parliamentary time allows so just a quick visual of the timeline, as I say, the consultation in September, closed in November, and our plans to publish the consultation response um, within hopefully the next couple of months. So I think that, that publication will be of big interest to, to all of you. Um, and just to finish off, uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, obviously, I look forward to hearing any questions in the panel discussion shortly. Um, but I've just put on this slide here some ways that um, some asks, some suggestions of how potentially you could help us in DCMS in terms of driving forward the agenda around the national data strategy as a whole, um, such as sharing stories or case studies of how data is creating positive outcomes. Um, our contact details um, are included in those slides. Thank you very much.
My ears kind of pricked up when you were speaking about the PETS prize, you know, the privacy enhancing technologies. About 20 years ago, the US uh, Defense Department wanted a small device that soldiers could carry, um, and if it was caves or a building or something like that, they could sort of throw it up into the air and it would fly in and it would have a camera and what have you, and they would be able to, you know, they'd spent millions, tens of millions of dollars trying to develop this. Um, and they were getting nowhere, and somebody came up with a bright idea of putting up a prize of $25,000 to the model makers of America. Uh, and within three months, somebody had designed the drone. You can buy them in little nowadays. It's a system that can work. How it works in relation to data and data protection, I don't know. But um, you know, it's, that's something we can actually find out in the question and answer session at the end of our three speakers. Next speaker is Leslie Holmes, DPO MHR. Question I suppose is when do we do this stuff? You know, is it, is it in the workplace, outside the workplace, combination of the pair? So, Leslie, over to you. Let me just put, make this low enough for me as I am a little bit vertically challenged. Good morning, everybody. Who's watching you? It's an interesting subject and it's one that I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes delving into as to who is watching you, how much watching of you do they do and where do they do it? So a little bit about me. I've been kicking around for a good more than 20 years but I've been doing data protection for about that length of time. Ten years directly with um, data protection in its pure form. And currently I'm the DPO for an HR, finance, payroll and analytics company. And that's about as much as I'm going to tell you about the company I work for, which is MHR. You don't want to hear about that. Okay, so the agenda for today is looking at the definitions of what monitoring and surveillance are, the proportionality, ethics and transparency, facial detection against facial recognition, and there is quite a significant difference, and the difference in when it's used, and where this is actually going, and then questions, but they will be on the panel session. Okay. So, monitoring, to watch closely. Hmm, interesting. And interestingly, surveillance is a subset of monitoring. So, we do actually do quite a lot of this. Every time you walk into a supermarket, you are surveilled. I'll leave you to think about that one. Interestingly, if with the pandemic, monitoring software sales have increased around about 58%. Is this because people are scared that their employees will do something wrong? Or is this the new version of presenteeism, where managers can't actually trust their people to do the job. So they expect them to either be in the office, which is the old way, or I'm going to watch everything you do. So it's something that we are conscious of, but we are not necessarily totally conscious of. So we are subconsciously conscious that somebody watches us, but why? And this comes on to proportionality. Why do I actually need to do this? What am I trying to achieve? Is it appropriate? Do I need to, what, to monitor every keystroke that somebody does? In some instances, absolutely. You know, I work for a company that processes millions of people's payrolls. Now, I need to make sure that somebody's not actually doing something with that data they shouldn't do. <coughs> so therefore, we monitor closely 
what people do, looking for trends. We don't naturally sit there and watch everything because we haven't got the capacity to do it. But we look for trends and if something kicks off, we then think about, oh, do we need to look into that a bit more closely? Again, comes back to what am I trying to achieve? Is it to make sure somebody's sat at their desk so I've actually switched on their camera on their laptop so I can watch them? A bit more presenteeism. Um, or is it because I have a legitimate reason to do so? And it's making sure that that is what you actually want to do. And have you got a justified reason for doing it? So that brings you on to the ethics side of it. Just because I can, does it mean I should? And that's always a question you have to ask yourself. Yes, I can monitor you. You know, near on the whole of your working day in a workplace environment. I can monitor you every time you walk into a supermarket. I can monitor your activity within that supermarket. Hmm. Why would I do that? I would do that to make sure you're not shoplifting. I have a reasonable excuse for doing it. But you know about that. So the next question is, so yeah, okay, I've got a reasonable reason to do it. How far do I go? How far do I actually put this monitoring and surveillance in? And there's lots of use cases for doing it, but there's also a lot of reasons why you shouldn't do it. So, activating the camera on your laptop so I can watch you is one reason. But does that give me the right to watch your family who wander in and out of view? No, it doesn't. How closely do I need to go with my monitoring? And then the next question is, is it fair? Am I betraying your trust? Should I actually trust you to get on with the job? And the answer for me, from an HR perspective, is yes. I should trust you. I should actually have the confidence that you're delivering your job. I should be monitoring your performance, your outputs, not what you do every day. Because people have shifted the way that they work to make sure that it suits work-life balance. So it might be that I start work at 7.30 in the morning, I have a two-hour lunch so I can go out and do the shopping or whatever else I need to do. I come back and I work till 7 in the evening. Unreasonable? Some employers would say yes. Some employers would say, no, that's perfectly fine. Have you done the job? You. Yeah. Our workplace monitors, and probably so does all of yours, monitors the websites that you go on to. And they do that to make sure that you're not doing something you shouldn't be doing. They block the porn sites, but there's other sites that um, you might go on that they don't want you to. Um, and making sure that that's proportionate is fine. But, you know, is it right that you can't go and have a look on Amazon for something in the middle of the afternoon? Well, some organisations use Amazon to buy stuff for the business. So it's not unreasonable. So, yeah, do I trust you to do your job? Do I trust you to get it delivered? I should do. But where that trust is betrayed the other way, then I might monitor you more closely. I'll come back to that. So, read that and tell me whether you would actually accept it or not. I'll give you a show of hands in a minute. Hmm. Okay. Would you sign up to a website that had that on their privacy notice? Yes? No, I didn't think so. In 
interestingly, that was on somebody's privacy notice. The question was raised to me about whether that was fair and proportionate to be on a website that the public or visitors could get onto. And the answer was no. As regards the situation that this was actually put in, it was for safeguarding. It was in a college. And actually, what they were looking for to make was to make sure that members of staff were not um, interacting inappropriately with students. So actually, in those instances, it was fair. What it wasn't fair was the same network was used for visitors. Different. Here's another one for you. <laughs> yes? No? No. No. Didn't think so. That's what Cambridge Analytica did on Facebook. They didn't bother telling anybody, though. But those are the sorts of things that happen in the real world. The first one was appropriate in its context. The second one never even got published. So it's all about that. OK, let's have a look at some case law and monitoring in action. We'll talk about two Spanish supermarkets. I love Spanish supermarkets. They give me a good laugh. Right, the first one was where the supermarket owners had identified that they'd got a loss of profits, but they couldn't identify where it was from. So they put in a covert CCTV above the tills. They had not got CCT above the tills. I mean, if you go into Sainsbury's here, they have, you can see them. They hadn't. They put in covert ones. The interesting thing of this case was that they were actually quite nice to the employees who were stealing from them and assisting their customers to steal from them. They actually said, resign, sign a compromise agreement, and we will leave it at that. Some of them did, some of them didn't. The ones who didn't took them to an employment tribunal. The tribunal said, oh, no, no, that's unfair. You can't admit that evidence. Um, you've impinged their human rights. So it went to review, and they upheld it. Eventually, the European Court of Human Rights, or sorry, European Court of Justice said, what's a load of rubbish? There was a good reason for doing it. If they'd been open about it, they wouldn't have done it. So you would never have caught them. The limited number of people who had access to it went in the favour of the supermarket. So as you can see, it's a proportionate use of covert surveillance. However, the other supermarket in Spain decided to use facial recognition technologies to identify people who were either had a criminal record or had a restraining order to stop them going into the supermarket. Unfortunately, it also captured everybody else, from granny to the baby. So they were considered to be over-collecting for the purpose and got quite a hefty fine. So there are two sides to any coin. Okay, so that's a bit of case law just to give you an idea of how fickle a thing is. Okay, so let's have a look at what's going on in the future. Facial detection. This is where they use a limited number of points on your face to determine your age, your ethnicity. Not quite sure how they do that, but they do. 
your um, age, ethnicity. I'm going. Sorry. Thank you, gender. And it's about 70-80% accurate. What they use it for is advertising and marketing in the main. And that's where you walk up to a billboard and the cameras have already identified what the target audience is that's walking up the supermarket alleyways and has said, right, okay, I'm changing that advert to one that's appropriate to that demographic. This was done in the Westfield shopping centres a few years ago. It wasn't allowed in the UK um, at that time, but it happened in Australia and it happened in South Africa. And there was quite a lot of it done. That is something that is happening here now. <coughs> the information is only held for a short period of time. Right. The other use of it is coming in. Age verification for alcohol sales. So you're completely... Um, people that organise or shops, Lidl and Aldi are bringing these in, where age verification is done by facial recognition or facial detection. What do they do with all the ones that aren't relevant? So, you know, I'm clearly over the age of 25. Clearly. But they're going to take a scan of my face. Are they going to keep it? Are they not going to keep it? It's going to get discarded immediately. I don't know. When am I going to get the privacy notice? I don't know. So it's new technologies. It's being brought forward. I'm not saying it's a bad thing because it gets me out the supermarket even quicker. But, you know, and there you go. The other one is facial detection, which is more about crime, crime prevention. You know, take, a, take a photograph of you on a body cam by a police person, and they can, within seconds or within minutes, know whether you are a criminal or not, purely from matching that photograph or that facial detection to a record that they've already got. It's a lot quicker and it's a lot easier. It's also used not necessarily as facial recognition or facial detection, but it is between the two for time recording. You rock up to a console, show your face, it clocks you in. It stops me clocking you in instead. But those sorts of technologies are now available you know, on the market and thriving. It allows people to stop fraudulent clocking in and out. It allows people to identify criminals, whatever. Your iPhone will now give you facial recognition when you're wearing a mask. Hmm. How does it do that? I don't know. But it's got to be looking at the shape of your eyes and the colour of your eyes. Oh, oh we're quite, getting quite close to a retina scan here. You use it on your passport. Again, same sort of thing. That's why you don't wear glasses when you, when you go and stick your face up to the thing or when you have your passport photo taken. It's done on facial recognition. It takes a map of the picture it matches the map of the picture to the map of your face as presented. These are technologies that are ubiquitous already. So, it'd be interesting to see where it goes. So, what have we talked about? What monitoring and surveillance is? The proportionality, ethics and transparency. What's going to happen in the future? And facial detection versus facial recognition. Thank you. Any questions in the panel? Indeed. Thank you very much.
I wish somebody would develop facial recognition software that would tell me that this woman standing in front of me is actually the woman that runs my wife's Pilates class. <laughs> you know, it's something useful like that. So when you meet somebody in a shop, you go, ah, oh, right, fair enough. Uh, third speaker, James Miller, privacy consultant for One Trust. Uh, James is an expert in user experience, and there's a, there's a slight free song with this phrase: "How to cultivate trust." Okay. So, James. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, <clears throat> so yes, valid proof of consent, how to cultivate trust and demonstrate compliance. Um, the free son, I did not choose the phrase cultivate trust. It sounds a bit like a gardener, um, but uh, the, main, the main theme is um, cultivating that trust between audience and the company. <clears throat> That's the wrong way. There we go. <laughs> so in terms of today's session, I'm basically going to talk about four main things. So firstly, I'm going to touch on the spirit of the law. So why does it even matter? Why should we bother cultivating trust as a society, as a government, as a company, between consumers? Why does that matter? Next, the letter of the law. Actually, when you look at the text, what are we actually talking about when we're talking about cultivating trust? What does that actually mean? Then we're going to move on to challenges to compliance. And then lastly, I'm just going to sketch upon some design features that we've thought about in terms of how we address these things. Okay, so first things first, the spirit of the law, why does it even matter? So <clears throat> once upon a time, I'd say in my grandparents' generation, everyone consumed, watched, read the same thing. Watch national TV, read a free paper, see mass advertising. That is simply not the way the world works anymore. And I think Leslie touched upon this. Now people watch algorithmic video, they read promoted and liked content, and they see personalized advertising, which I think we've already kind of been over here. As much as changing, um, changing a billboard, that's a very physical action that's happening every single second when you browse through Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. You are seeing different feeds than everyone else. And this has really caused a trust problem to be frank. So 47%, less than half of brands, are seen as trustworthy nowadays, and 40% of people love brands but no longer trust them. Now trust, this isn't actually a new phenomenon that trust is going away, it's actually been going away since, i say, the 1920s to 30s, people drawn in that generation are the most trusting. Um, Robert Putnam, an American sociologist, wrote a book called Bowling Alone, which is basically about how trust and uh, social capital between people has been declining. And this is a trend which has continued. So 40% of people no longer um, buying from brands because they don't trust them. I'm pretty sure we can all think of one, um, but for me it's eBay. Um, I love eBay, I love buying tat, but unfortunately someone else loved selling tat from my account from Vietnam, which means that I no longer trust them with their data. So that's it, they've torched the relationship. And as far as I'm concerned, they're doing nothing to promote that image back. So right, trust is at an all-time low, but how has actually this, this happened? How have we got to the situation that we've got? So the way that we like to think about it is there's been a focus over time on different things. So first thing, price and quality. What I like to call the age of tex Tesco. When manufacturing economies were first coming to fruition, we're talking about 8% growth, stack it high, sell it cheap. We then moved on to what I like to call the age of Spotify. Not tell me what I want to buy, tell me what, oh sorry, not even me getting value for money, but actually tell me what I want to buy. Show me that next thing that I want. Experience engagement. Also Amazon, another company which comes to mind here. And now trust and transparency here. So 70% of consumers say trusting a brand now is more uh, important than in the past. That's come from an Edelman report, which is uh, trust as the new brand equity. So regarding this, what I would say is we're now entering what I would call the age of Apple or the age of um, Google. Apple and Google, I'll come on to this a little bit more later, but they're really pivoting on this uh, element of trust. They know that this is a differentiating factor. They know that Android are catching up to them or have caught up to them or are simply a different user experience on a variety of panes. And therefore, now I think 44% of people who switch from an Android to an Apple device do so because they believe that Apple are more... Um, better using, well, that's probably the wrong word, more safe, more safe with their data. I'm sure I could find a better word if I was up here a longer time. Okay, so why is this happening? 
So first thing, I think we've uh, touched upon this in some of the other talks, but there's an expansion of privacy laws across the world. Um, GDPR, obviously the landmark piece of legislation here. A lot of other emerging markets catching up as well um, now as well. And so uh, proliferation of privacy laws really all over the place. When we look at that, we're also looking at, you know, South Africa, for example, has Papaya as a legislation. Brazil has the LGPD. Um, Saudi Arabia has just launched the PDP. This is a real proliferation. And I think whereas it was the case when GDPR came out that when consumers clicked a cookie banner, it was that first time and, you know, perhaps they discarded it. But now people are more switched on to those rights. And, for example, when Mark Zuckerberg testified in front of Congress, that really brought to the forefront of people's mind that these companies do do something with your data, and it is your data as well. So that's also promoted technology changes as well. So Apple already in Safari phased out third-party cookies, which are used to track um, browsing across the web, and Google are going to do so at the end of 2023. So I've touched on this, but biggest company in the world by market capitalization, I believe, um, and they're pivoting on privacy. And just a couple of things about kind of what that actually means in the, in, in, in the trust sphere and, and kind of why that matters. Um, so a little bit about what it means how to be trusted. So these are kind of the normal things. So 69% um, of people be a dependable provider, 64% are around the mid 60s, reliable source of information, be a protector, be an innovator, and 50% of people consider being an educator as well quite an important part of that trust experience. And then what being trusted means. So in short, we can throw, uh, sum this up in three main things. S loyalty, engagement, advocacy. So more trust, more loyalty. 75% of people with high trust report that they will take one or more of these actions. I will buy this brand even if it's not the cheapest. This is the only brand of this product that I will buy. If this brand put out a new product, I will be very interested in buying it and will check it out immediately. On engagement, 60% of people with high trust said they are comfortable sharing their personal information with this brand. It's important for marketing and advertising. It's also important between the relationship of the consumer and the firm. And last thing on advocacy, 78% of people with high trust report that they will take one or more of these actions. I am likely to share or repost content about this brand. If asked, I will recommend this brand and I will defend this brand if I ever hear someone criticizing it. So this basically means that trust is a part of consumer experience now. You cannot have personalized experiences in a sales and marketing sphere without privacy choices. That revenue generation now depends on user choice. People want to be engaged. Adobe recently uh, launched a new report that the right message at the right time increases trust in a brand. 70% of people want to see that right message at that right time. And by doing that, that then increases the trust that you've got in this brand. Okay, so we've talked about why this matters. Now let's talk about actually what this means on a legal basis. Now there's six different bases for processing data. I'm sure this will be familiar to many people in this room. Um, but the main one that we think about when we talk about trust is either consent or legitimate interest. Now we end up pivoting mainly on consent. Why is that the case? Consent is how a user or a consumer defines a relationship between a company and a brand that they care about and themselves. They choose about how much data they hand over. For example, I have a very simple value exchange with Tesco. They get a nice club card from me because they have put their meal deals as club card only. They get to keep my data, I get to keep one pound. It's a very simple value exchange. I've decided that's the relationship I want to have in Tesco. Now, companies can use legitimate interests, but you do, are required to use a balance test. And how exactly are you going to justify that to a consumer or potentially a regulatory body if you act outside of that legitimate interest balance test? So actually, just let's talk about getting that consent in practice. There's a couple of things that we have to think about here. Unbundled for a start. Can't bundle it in with a service. If you're giving a bank loan, it doesn't automatically mean that you can sign someone up to advertising. It has to be an active and affirmative action, currently at the, at the current state of play at least. It has to be granular, so you're allowed to segregate out exactly the options to consenting for different things. It's got to be informed, so I have to know what I'm consenting about. 
interesting piece on cookie regu uh, regulation at the moment is there's a lot of discussion about whether this is truly um, informed consent to cookies due to the sheer amount of data processing that goes on in the background with some of the algorithmic content that I've been talking about that goes on. Uh, these auctions go on every single time that you click on a website with uh, what called demand side platforms. Can that be informed consent? Um, the best thing you can do is at least try and uh, the best you can to comply with the regulation and give your users the best choices that you possibly can. It has to be no imbalance of power and it also has to be as easy to give as it is to withdraw. And a lot of marketing and sales uh, interactions rely on these, uh, this consent activity. So when we're thinking about um, actually the kind of cultivating this trust, um, personalization, sharing data with third parties and conversions, all rely on me giving legitimate consent to someone and in short I think I've been over um, the conversion side with uh, my Tesco example but personalization as I said I want to see right the right advert at the right time uh, but I also want it to be displayed in the, in the right ways as well and share with third parties just thinking about a little perhaps user experience if I'm lucky enough to go out and buy a Land Rover tomorrow although I might go and take it around a muddy field the day after I don't immediately want to um, hear about James's car washing service that's probably not something that I would like however if I define my relationship with Land Rover and said I was okay with sharing their data for relevant products probably is something that I would like and this is the difference really this person define how they want to be treated or you can impose on how you would like them to to transact with you how you want that relationship to go now <clears throat> in terms of more moving toward more the more legal aspects how this normally looks is something like this so you have an identifier and a timestamp and a flag um, has Zach consented to such a thing yes or no um, unfortunately the problem is that this uh, isn't quite what the letter of the law said for all of these specific reasons so we've talked about consent being unbundled we've talked about people consenting to granular things and the ICO wants to see this they want to see who consented and when what they were told and how they consented as well the name of the individual other identifier a dated document as Leslie has just been over, there is a lot of difference between privacy policies and as you update these policies, someone may be consenting to something completely different. Okay. So we've been over why care and we've been over the specific legal basis that we're going to lean on here. Now perhaps we should think about actually what challenges this to presents to compliance. So this is an example of Microsoft's Smart Tech Stack. Um, and it always makes me smile because it's a complete mess. Um, I, d I just don't even want to go into that, to be honest. But you can see how many different types of processing we've got in there. Now, you can perhaps segregate these into broad chunks, and that's how you can inform consumers um, that you are going to process their data for a particular thing. But then again, they've got this problem, right? There's a spider web of interactions, and this is with three people, which, you know, this is an example of where they might interact and then the systems that they end up going in. But actually, when we're thinking about this um, as compliance, as privacy as well, promoting that user experience, unfortunately, consumers don't just behave like we can send them to one touch point. Um, every touch point is an opportunity for someone to define their relationship with a company, actually how they should use your data. So just even taking a typical user experience here, I might accept cookies, then I might sign up to a newsletter, and then I might, tell, um, and then I might call up customer service and tell them never to contact me again. Um, and that's three, perhaps, interactions in a very short space of time, to, but potentially to three separate systems that I've then defined my relationship with. And this presents a massive problem because normally these systems aren't set up to process that exact kind of data. At the very minimum, you need to think about how actually we're gonna ferry this data from one place to another from those transactions. So this ends up probably sitting in between quite a few departments. 
at One Trust, probably the people who we most often speak to about this, sit between the governance, privacy, and marketing spheres. Uh, legal and technology also have an involvement here. Um, but that's largely because uh, governance, privacy, and marketing all have a stake in exactly how people's data is used. Privacy is more concerned about the legal and legis legislative acts, uh, aspects there, as, as Leslie was saying, actually using the data, defining that consumer relation as it's supposed to. Governance wants to clean up data, have nice clean systems in the background. Uh, this is a problem if you've got loads and loads of touch points and they all need to talk to each other and it's many to many and oh goodness, um, everyone panics. And marketing want to have a nice UX experience. So the last thing I'm going to talk about and talk in more broad brush strokes about the things that we've thought about when we're defining a solution here. And as I've said, there are multiple different places where someone can give a consent transaction and can set the relationship and the tone of, of, of that processing. We need to think about how we are taking this interaction and feeding it through appropriately into some of those downstream databases. So where you don't have a real-time synchronization, you're potentially out of compliance and you're also potentially losing that trust between a user experience and, um, and the overall firm as well. Going to need to prove consent and also for that to be granular, and we're going to need to action any data that we have compliantly. So, <clears throat> if you are thinking about a solution to this, one of the things that you probably should think about is exactly how you're going to split apart those purposes. Now, this is the way we do it, it's not the only way to do it. However, that Excel spreadsheet is probably a little bit too robust on off. A flag probably isn't sufficient um, for what we're talking about. We're going to need to be more granular if you, God forbid, were ever to get audited or if you want to appropriately use that user data. We need to understand um, that single source of truth for compliance and consent. And then when, when we're thinking about how users interact with this, it's one thing to say, yes, you can send me an email. Yes, I'm happy to hear from you. Yes, fine, I will sign up to your telesales if you're going to give me a 50% discount. It's another thing to actually go, okay, well, how often do you want to hear about us? From when? About what? Would you like to hear about this event? They're two sides of the same coins. So preference centers, as far as we're concerned, are often, often built on top of that kind of core consent framework. So if you are at any point dealing with consent or preferences in your system, it probably makes sense to draw that preference center off that system that you started with. As Lexity touched upon, a very, very big difference in um, both purposes of processing and also policies. This is probably also something that you're going to have to think about in terms of who has consented to what, at what point. Cool. And that's a bit of a demonstration, but I think we can skip that. So, yes, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, I think we're going to move on to questions from Mark. Indeed. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Opportunity now to ask questions of any of our first three speakers. Um, we've got a couple of live microphones in the hall, so if you've got a question, stick your hand up. Um, I'll identify you. If you could then identify yourself when you get the microphone and ask your question, that would be helpful. There's no point in asking the question without the microphone because nobody else will hear it. Okay, so has anybody got a question to begin with? Okay, I'm going to start with one that's uh, come in from one of our listeners at home. Uh, this is from Gavin Jarvie, um, and I'm going to put this first, I suspect, to Leslie. Mm -hmm. If facial detection and recognition through tools such as Clearview AI are being used, then what data retention periods are being used to keep that data on file and delete that data afterwards, especially for people who do not have criminal convictions, in order to ensure that these individuals don't become subject to any data breach by the companies retaining that information? Any idea? Good question. It is, isn't it? It is. And this is down to the organisation that's actually collecting the data. Because if you collect the data, you have to have a purpose for collecting it. And then if you retain the data, you have to have a purpose for retention. So it's then about saying, well, going back to the proportionality issue, how long do I need to keep it for? For what purpose do I need to keep it? So if I clearly identify that, going back to the facial detection and age verification, that you're definitely over 25, it's fine that you buy that bottle of wine. 
um, then realistically they don't need to keep it any longer than the processing time for that. However, if it triggers and says this person looks like they're under 25, um, but over 18, and bear in mind we don't know how far this technology has got, then they would need to keep that for a period of time so that that age verification can be validated. Or does it then say, actually, this person looks like they're under 25, I'll have a human review it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, how are they actually looking at doing that? Um, but looking at things like clear, Clearview AI and so on, it comes back to how long do you need to keep it for? If it's 30 seconds, fine. If it's three years, what for? Mm -hmm. you know, it goes, and this is not just a, a, a facial recognition issue. This is a record retention issue generally. Anything to add to that, Lee? No, I just, I think the, I just echo that final point about um, it being a wider issue about records retention. Okay. Uh, this question is directed at you from Gary Clark. Uh, take, uh, talking about free flow of personal data across borders is somewhat alarming, given there are many countries with weak privacy legislation, such as the US. How are we ensuring that we maintain parity with the EU and similar regions that have strong privacy controls? Given the Home Office keeps trying to ban encryption, how can we trust that, and I've lost this one, how can we trust that the UK is actually committed to ensuring data privacy? So in terms of um, cross-border flow, so we, we transposed the GDPR legislation, UK law, as we left the EU, and we've worked with the EU to get a data adequacy agreement mm -hmm. in place, which means that we deem the EU, the EU deems us adequate for the free flow of data, the appropriate protections in place. Um, and what, obviously at the moment, in the EU, the EU would obviously have adequacy agreements with other countries outside the EU, similar principle where each has to deem the other adequate, have the adequate protections in place to allow that data to flow freely between um, jurisdictions. So obviously now we've left the EU, the focus is on entering into adequacy agreements with countries around the world. And as, as we announced last summer, um, we've already prioritised a number of countries which we're in those negotiations with at the moment to make sure that the adequacy agreements are in place, the protections are in place to allow that free flow of data. Okay, but one of the things that you said in your presentation, and, and I'm sure these are not your words, it's probably from a government document, you talked about the newfound sovereignty now that we're out of the EU, um, and this would allow us to do different things. If those different things are such a great idea, why aren't EU countries doing them? In terms of, the, what I mean by that, sorry, is the fact that now outside the EU we have repatriate powers to make changes to data protection laws, we have powers to enter into these negoc yeah. negotiations with other countries. That's what I meant by it. No, no, no I, 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 I can accept that, but you know, what, what is it, we, I mean, are we going to be reducing controls on this? No, no, the, the apps, obviously, what I've tried to reiterate today is the fact that we want to make use of these repatriate powers to make reforms where we think it will help ensure that we can make changes that allow data to um, capitalise on those opportunities I've talked about with data. Yeah. But while we obviously are, we are absolutely determined that we maintain those high data protection standards um, at the same time. It's how, about how do you do that, though? Because I, mean, you know, I actually wrote down, wants cake and to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so effectively, you're saying, right, we want to maintain really high standards of protection and what have you, but we also yeah. want to be more liberal and communicate with people and what have yeah, you. So this are those two things achievable? Well. This is why I have to uh, use the um, get out of jail free card that obviously the consultation response will set out what we think we can take forward based on what we've heard for that consultation. So until obviously that is published, I can't say definitively how we're going to take, what we're going to take forward, how we're going to take it forward. Yeah. Obviously yeah. the whole point is we've set out our ambitions, we've set out the fact that we've got the repatriated powers, we want to take advantage of them. This is how we think we can do it. The consultation set those proposals out. We've obviously, we're listening, analysing the feedback. Yeah. And then we will set out what we think we can take forward as a result. Okay. Can I, I'm sorry. I thought this was a really interesting point regarding the repatriated powers. So one of the things with adequacy decisions is that, as far as I'm aware, you need to perform them on a, a regularity basis with a lot of the con uh, economies. So the EU is obviously a massive data protection kind of superpower right next door to us. 
does that give them veto power on any potential changes that we will impose? So obviously the EU has a huge interest in the EU in, in what we're proposing because there is, there is the risk, I would class it as a risk, that obviously if they see it as what we're proposing to do and what we're proposing to legislate on, if it's seen as diverging too far from mm -hmm. their protections, would they seem, deem the adequacy agreement as no longer um, adequate or valid? But obviously that's why as part of this work we're really in close discussions with the, with the Commission um, explaining what we're doing. Obviously, until we, until we set out the government response to consultation, obviously, it is, it is a consultation at this stage. We've set out our proposals, we'll listen to the feedback, and then we'll set out what we think we can take forward, what, um, of that, what requires legislative change, and also we'll continue to engage with the Commission throughout that process um, to tr obviously manage that risk. Again, I'm conscious of the fact that there's a gentleman holding the microphone there, but I just want to finish this off, if you don't mind, sir. Sure. Um, what do ministers, I mean, forget the consultation, consultations are wonderful exercises, but what do ministers want to see happen? Well, obviously ministers, will, um, they'll, they're obviously interested in the feedback. We obviously have to go through a process of collective agreement, so until we go through that process, obviously every minister across government will have a chance to feed in and make sure they're happy with the direction of travel. Um, but we're not at that stage yet, so I can't say definitively what, um, what each view of the minister is, but... Obviously, they're, they're core part of the process. We need to make sure that whatever we're proposing to do has that cross-government approval, which is obviously what the process of doing now. Okay, thank you. So, sorry. Um, hello, my name is uh, Cedric. Um, Lee, I've got another question for you. I'm so sorry. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you, Let's pick on Lee, then. <laughs> you know, when you mentioned the uh, national digital strategy, I, I instantly thought of Estonia or rather Estonia, so they're very good at having all their data online. So, and they have a, pr they have a, a principle, I, had to, I always have to write it down, hold on, it's the ask once pr uh, principle. So you don't need to always have your proof of ID, proof of address all the time, because it is just part of, it is part of a larger database. Now they are an EU country, so they do supposedly follow the GDPR well, hopefully, I don't know. So I was wondering, can we finally see something similar to this, you know, where data is pulled together more and works, you know, is more consumer friendly, a bit more user friendly, as opposed to, you know, when I had to rent here in Edinburgh, I had to give the, my whole life away, you know, and just, be, and as opposed to just, well, can I just give you my national insurance number and you just find it out for yourselves? That's my question for you. Yeah, so um, obviously we've looked at countries like Estonia, we've looked at um, sort of international comparisons as a core part of um, developing the national data strategy. Um, and all the sorts of things you've talked about there are, as I said at the start, there's so many different elements and facets to the national data strategy implementation. The plans for reforming, reforms to the data protection regime is one element, but also we're looking at um, how, how can we better utilize data to improve delivery of public services, um, there's the whole mission around how government can make use of data more effectively and across the public sector. So all those sorts of considerations are like a core part of, of those missions and of those work programs as we progress. Um, but as I say, we're, it's, a, it's a process. Um, so as we'll continue to provide updates on you know, delivery of specific elements of the strategy, specific um, deliveries around different missions as we progress. Um, but yeah, rest assured, obviously, they're, they're core objectives that we, we share with you in terms of trying to improve the delivery of public services using data more effectively. Yeah. If I can just add a little bit to that for, for you. One of the services that is available from government is called Tell Us Once. So if there is a negative event in your family and that you're bereaved, you can go to the Tell Us Once service. You tell one part of the government um, mechanisms and it tells everybody else so it actually takes away some of the stress of that particular activity and going back to what Cedric said if we can do that from the other end actually be quite useful just out of curiosity that tell us once I mean that obviously covers all the government agencies would they do would they make that information available for example to life insurance or life assurance companies no no. Not at this stage. Not at this stage. No. Because that would be quite useful too in some regards. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. If it's a validated 
claim, yeah. then yes. But usually that goes through the probate yes. yeah, position. Yeah. So it's a, a different process. And in some respects, you've got to make sure that the right people or persons get the benefit of that insurance. Yeah. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Yeah. But there's no reason why there shouldn't be a level of notification. But how many life insurance companies are there that you would have to tell because you don't know mm -hmm. who they were insured with? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, another question's come in saying, colleagues with remote desktop software, I'm going to put this to you, James. Colleagues, just to get your views on it, colleagues with remote desktop software and privileged access can discreetly monitor staff in the workplace just by a few changes to an individual's registry keys. If you're in a large organisation and have a large network that includes a lot of IT colleagues, what controls are in place to prevent them being nosy? <laughs> well, I think with regards to that, probably comes down to a central power like a DPO in order to really legislate between the employer and the employee there. Um, as I kind of mentioned, with regards to clauses of, uh, of consent and data processing, we need to, we need to look at the proportionality there. Um, but we also need to look at the, the power exchange. Um, it's clear that any particular colleague, um, as I think Leslie stressed in, in her presentation, wouldn't really be able in a large corporation to push back on such a level. Um, that would be effective to impinge on that data processing. So I'd probably say that it's it's a responsibility of a centralised or or at least decentralised power to to have oversight there and on protecting the user's data. Mm. Anything to add on that, Lisa? Yeah, from the point of view of um, our IT colleagues being nosy, an urban myth um, that I heard was that the security team um, monitored what. Um, shopping was done by certain female members of staff and what sizes they were buying. Um, <laughs> it was an urban myth. However, that is a potential risk. It's policy and it's enforced. As soon as somebody is noted to be doing that sort of thing, mm. That should be an enforced HR policy that says this is a disciplinary um, and depending on the severity of it, whether you get a verbal warning, a written warning, or here's the door. So it's, it's one of the things you were talking about, James, I actually wrote down, you know, that there's, actually a, there's a very fine line sometimes between personalised messaging and being stalked, you know, for the company being actually being pretty creepy. You know, how do they determine where that line is? Well, I think, as I stressed, it's, it's in regards to how the user sets their, their preferences and their data. Um, if you want to see stalking, you need only open almost any social media app on your phone and then look at the first advert, which is almost certainly from your cookies, uh, either in-app or out-of-app, um, that have been transported across. Um, and that's, that's the worrying thing, right? That's, that's the thing that a lot of this data sharing does go on. Um, and users have very little control and understanding there. Um, companies, as third-party cookies are being deprecated, can move to a way to pivot more on that first-party data. It's a free data source that every company has, um, and it's a data source that can be leveraged, and you can ask those people how they want to define their relationship with your company. Now, it doesn't. that's not to say that those user interactions don't have a place, right? There is a place in, in helping get your product out there. But the thing is, there is a balance to be struck between being a trusted organization and carpet bombing everyone who has ever searched a term similar to what your company does. Interesting. Thank you. Question at the back there, please. Hi. Is that on? Yeah. Uh, this is for Lee. Uh, my name is Sam Clark from MLEX. Um, so John Edwards has been talking recently, uh, he was at a conference yesterday and been doing a few interviews um, about, and he's, he's spoken about the data reforms, um, and he has said he doesn't think they endanger adequacy, and he said they, he doesn't think they're radical, but he's also said there's a few elements of them that he's uncomfortable with. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between the, the ICO and DCMS, and essentially whether what the ICO says holds more weight than other responses to the consultation. So if there's three areas he said he's uncomfortable with. Will you 
follow that and, and get rid of them, or how does that work? Um, well, until um, we go through the collective agreement of ministers, I can't preempt or say, confirm if certain measures will be dropped or taken forward. I'm afraid we have to wait until that process is taken through. All I can say is, as you would expect, we work very closely with the ICO and we take huge stock and value in their views, and obviously that's a core part of now analysing the responses, um, working out what we can take forward, um, pulling together the government response, and then agreeing that with ministers across government and then publishing it. So I'm afraid that's all I can really say at this stage. Okay. Gentlemen there, please. Hi there. I'm uh, Doug from Johnson Camichael. It's a question for James, unfortunately, for you. Um, <laughs> I read recently that these big tech giants, your Amazons, your Googles, use so much AI now that there's no one person in the firm who actually understands what's going on with it all. So how do, you actually, how do we actually, as consumers, trust that these companies are actually walking the walk as well as saying they do it? How do we actually know? Are they being audited? How, what sort of controls are there over these people? <clears throat> in reality yeah that's a that's a great question and I think it is one thing obviously portraying an element of trust giving users preferences and it's another thing enforcing them right and I think that's 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 totally fair I think some of the information commissioners offices are, around the world are waking up to how uh, people are using data, for example. Um, the EU and the US are quite judicious in particular, so the Canal in France love slapping a nice big fine on, on Amazon and Google most recently. Even poor old grinders come under the, um, un under the light in Norway, um, unfortunately, and they ended up with a fine. Um, but I think that's, that's probably the point that I would pivot on, right? Ultimately, consumers are one part of the relationship, firms are another part of the relationship and governments are a third part of the relationship here. Tech companies over the past years have proven themselves fairly incompetent of managing their own governance, unfortunately, when it comes to user data. And therefore, I would stress, and you know, perhaps poor old Lee is, is <laughs> going to get another earful for me, but it, I, would, I would stress that governments need to take responsibility in terms of the way that, that companies are using data and, and really have proper audit capabilities within their supervisory authorities to make sure that companies do behave in line with the policies and the consent that they're given. Okay. Question up at the back, please. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Marie Claire Trainer. I work for Heineken. Um, but my question is more from the perspective of just a normal punter. Yeah, so what troubles me with all of this, um, uh, and it relates to a, a few things that have been said this morning, is what is being done to sort of really demystify things for a normal person. So there's consent, um, but how do I have informed consent? Uh, because if I don't accept that I, if I want to have 15% off something or I want to have access to club card points in Tesco, then I have to consent or I don't get access to that, whatever it is. Yeah? But I don't really know what I'm signing up for. I don't really know what data it is that the government is negotiating to share with uh, the US. Um, is there anything being done to actually give that visibility and that access to the actual data. Now, I know it's very difficult. I work in data management. I've worked in data management for 20 years. But I'm not really seeing anything yet that's really recognizing that challenge that as a normal person in the street, as a punter, I really want to be able to ask the question, OK, if I say that you can use my data for X, Y, Z, if I say that you can share my data with the US or any other country, can I actually see what that is? Yeah. Can I actually give me access to what it is that I'm genuinely signing up for rather than just a principle so that I can get a service? So I know it's not an easy question, but is there anything as part of the national data strategy or anything that has been done in any other way that is actually addressing that problem and that question that I want answered because I want to say it's my data, you agree it's my data, so can I see it please? <laughs> It's yeah. an excellent question. I'm going to add somebody else's question, and this is Jens Rasmussen, because it, it actually allies very nicely with what you're just saying. Um, given that 97% of users of popular online services skip the reading of the extremely long terms and services and provide our consent in a flash, 
Is the trust really based on compliance and transparency, or is it more of a marketing exercise, a box ticking exercise? So let's just run down the panel. Lee, for a start, you know, how I mean, you, what, what, we have no idea what we're giving consent for half the time. Well, um, in terms of um, trust in data use in general, as I said, it's a core part of national data strategy. We want to make sure that um, issues like transparency, like you say, that where data is used for good, that that's publicised, it's made clear, um, that people understand how data can be used effectively. On the specific questions around consent, obviously, um, the data protection legislation is in place. Um, I'd have to uh, take away your question to speak to some of the data protection experts in the team to give you a more definitive answer, I'm afraid. Leslie? Okay. Um, yeah. I totally agree with you. I've got no idea what I've consented to half the time. And I do read the privacy notices because that's my sort of job. Um, and I still don't know what I've consented to. Um, you know, we've, we've had a number of, um, how shall I say, government initiatives to share data across with health services, etc. Yes, I want you to share my data across the NHS because I get sick of giving the same thing over and over and over again. And you've all got access to the same system, so realistically, why shouldn't you? Um, but, yeah, understanding what actually is being shared and who it's being shared with and for what um, is actually really challenging from my perspective because People don't read. They trust, to a degree, that whatever it is that they've put in there is being used for whatever purpose it was that they put it in there for, and that it's not being used for half a dozen other things under legitimate interest that they've not read about. Um, so, realistically, it's just being... I think we need to be clearer about what we do and how we do it. Um, but... Achieving that in a simple and understandable way at the point you actually push the button and say yes, that is a challenge. Yeah. I think both the question which came from online and the question in the room, there are a couple of absolutely enormous topics raised there. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and tick some of them off. Um, but I think the first thing that I could probably do here is, is, is actually acknowledge the challenge. I think it's totally fair to say that as consumers, a lot of us don't understand where exactly our data has gone and have a huge amount of relationships and we often make decisions on those very very quickly because as cookie banners come up, as we interact with particular brands, as we buy something online, those are all exchanges that go past in our day-to-day -day and we need to do something about it um, and, and, and move on to the next task we've got. <clears throat> now, I think your question was perhaps more of a societal one as well, like how, what, what direction are we moving in? Probably how, how quickly as well. Um, so on some, of, on some of the pieces there, so for example, I know um, NYOB, which is a major, major privacy um, legislator or major privacy organization, recently raised the SCREMS 2 agreement, which was in short um, trying to strike down data transfers between the UK and the US. Now, that perhaps isn't something which strikes you as a day-to-day -day individual, but there are organizations out there pushing for more privacy rights, and I think that's filtering through into governments as well and organizations. So governments, for example, America is a little bit behind the curve in terms of a federal legislation, but they do have uh, legislations, particularly California is in front, and some of those emerging markets that I was on about as well. So I think by the end of next year, I think 75% of the world is going to be covered by a privacy legislation. Now, it's obviously not going to answer your question about okay, well, how do I define my relationship with every single, cons uh, every single company that I've dealt with? How do I say that I just blanket don't want to be tracked on the internet, you know, perhaps, other than perhaps changing a browser? Um, but there are, I would say that I would perhaps argue that there are movements and understandings there um, more than certainly 20, 25 years ago. I think that there's a, there's a lot of work still to be done here, um, but I think we, we are moving in a direction of of more tri privacy transparency. Okay. Question at the back, please. Hi, good morning. Um, Chris McMullen from SCORE. 
Um, I guess my question is to, to Lee. Um, we're speaking about a national uh, strategy um, for data. We already have problems with government um, use of personal data, DVLA being a prime example, where we cannot give consent due to the nature of the interactions that we have with that organisation. We have to allow them access to our data. In Scotland, we're protected from, from the sharing of that information to private companies, not so much in England. And I, I really want to understand how the data strategy is going to address those concerns that, that you know, citizens should have. So in terms of um, data sharing among the public sector, among organisations like the EVLA, obviously that comes under the mission free of the uh, national data strategy. Um, so that is very much focused on the issues you're talking about. So it's how can government use data more effectively, so improving the quality of data held across government, making sure there's consistent standards in place. And then looking at data sharing specifically, it's looking at um, whether it's legislative, cultural barriers, or like issues, practicalities, like you say, um, difficulties, like you say. Um, how can they best Sorry, be Sorry, can, can I just cut in? I'm speaking about the commercialisation of data that the government receives from citizens, not, not necessarily about quality, about the, the general sharing across government, but we, we have to interact. If we want to drive a car in the UK, we have to provide our information to DVLA. That information is then sold on to third parties for parking enforcement or other um, things that we don't consent to, and we have, no, we have no ability to remove that consent. I'm afraid, I'd have to take that question away, I'm afraid. I'm not, I'm not sure of the answer. Okay. Just, again, I'm always fascinated with a live audience because I, I was watching your reaction as, as our, our speakers were delivering their presentations and things uh, and just watching your faces, watching the looks in your faces. And I have to say there's about two people in this room who could make a living as professional poker players. <laughs> the rest of you suffer from what my daughter describes as serious facial leakage. Um, when you're looking ahead to the future of data perfect protection, bearing in mind that you are all professionals, Stick your hand up if you think that the likely changes in future are going to be a good thing, are going to be an improvement. I'll put my hand up. I've got one person there. Two. Three. Four. Optimistic bunch, aren't we? <laughs> why, no, just, I'm curious, why is that? Why do you think it's not going to be a good thing? Does anybody want to stick their head above the parapet? Stick it right at the back there. Mark, I think you're missing a category. It's the I don't care category. All right, okay. As far as legislation goes, I think we're missing a trick between the DPOs in the room, the DPOs understanding your tech stack, working with your IT functions, and actually having conversations with your ISO, or CISO, whatever they're called this week. <laughs> so, you know, data privacy, great. Woohoo! Your data boat has sailed, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry. It is absolutely sailed. I know it's a contentious thought, but it has. Which is why, I would, James, when I press cookies, I don't care. It's a thing, do, isn't it? Do you think that situation's got worse during... No, hang on to the microphone, because I'm asking you this question. Do you think that situation's got worse during COVID? Because I think most of us have got to the stage of thinking, oh, sod it, just tick the box. Mark, I'll be absolutely honest. No. You think it was always this bad? Absolutely. So if you think about it, and you've all worked from home, now some of you live in city centres, some of you live in nice housing estates, but you will have seen human behaviour that you didn't see before because you were in the office. I'm fairly certain that the people at number 12 have always dealt drugs, but none of us were home to actually notice this interaction. <laughs> fair, fair point. Any, anyone else? Yeah, that gentleman there, please. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Malcolm Minch, I Systems Integration. Um, just, just to sort of like follow on from that, um, you know, about no caring. <clears throat> uh, when just before lockdown happened, I got caught in a speed camera and I had to do a motorway awareness course, um, which told me uh, that my phone can be tracked by the police from when I joined the motorway they can track it through all the masks to find out how fast I've gone along the motorway. They can see what I was doing on the phone. They can check if I was 
flicking through sites or whether I was sending an email or whatever without touching my phone. So I didn't do track and trace. Because if they know that about me, they know exactly where I am. <clears throat> they know I'm sitting here with two phones right now and a laptop in my bag. So I, maybe to Leslie, does that not make Schrems too in the European Court of Justice decision on that a wee bit hypocritical? Yeah. <laughs> Short answer to that. It's interesting, you know, people get quite uppity or quite concerned about the amount of track and trace and the amount of tracing that um, happens. But like you say, you've got a geolocator sat in your pocket 24-7 near as damn it. How many people in this room have actually turned off the location services on their phone? I have, yeah. <coughs> if you haven't, and it's, it's there all the time, you can be tracked. And you are tracked. Mark, which, which of those two phones is your burner phone? <laughs> <laughs> Liz, I'm going, to, I'm going to keep this quite quick because there's one last question here, please. No, I think just to, just to add to that, uh, the, the whole the speed of change in the IT space just cannot keep up with legislation change, how long it takes to get any form of data legislation updated. It's never going to keep speed with, the, with change and progress in an IT space. So I think that whole, that boat has sailed. It's really, really, I don't see how we can ever really keep up with what the next developments are because they're out there and they're in the world and they're happening before we've had a chance and then it takes years to get consultations, next little legislation through and we've already passed and moved on to the next thing by the time the legislation's out. Yeah. I'm going to take that as a statement just because of timing, etc. Thank you very much. I mean, that's actually been a very lively Q&A session, which is great. And I've got about another half dozen questions from virtual delegates uh, sitting on my phone now at the moment. We haven't got time to go through. Can I ask you to thank our first three speakers one more time, please? Thank you. All right. We're going to break for tea and coffee, take the time to visit the exhibition stands. The next session actually starts at 25 to midday, and they'll be run as breakouts. Uh, if you're in, obviously, if you're here, look at the back of your badge, and it should be noted in your badge where you're supposed to be. Uh, Laura Irvin's presentation, Breakout F, will be run virtually due to COVID disruptions, and if you selected this option in person, we've listed an alternative. Lunch will be at quarter to one, and the final session begins right here at half past one, here in the biosphere. Go and enjoy your tea and coffee. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you.